say, George, you seen the paper today? Don't break my concentration when I'm taking the shot, Ira. But Georgie, there's an article you need to see. It says... I don't care what it says, Ira. I told you not to break my concentration. George Gershwin is to play Paul Whiteman's concert and experiment in modern music. You're pulling my leg again, Ira. There ain't no concert by no Paul Whiteman that I'm playing in. Now, let me get back to my shot. Gershwin is currently at work on a jazz concerto for the event. Don't listen to him, George. You know how Ira likes to mess with you. The concert is to take place in Manhattan's Aeolian Hall on 12 February 1924. But that's... just five weeks away. The audience will comprise the most celebrated luminaries of the music establishment. Why, even Rachmaninoff and Stravinsky will be there. Yep, that's right. Few composers can claim to have been panicked into writing a masterpiece. But George Gershwin wasn't your standard composer. Gershwin was born in New York City in 1898. He dropped out of school aged 15 to become a song plugger, a pianist employed by a music publisher to promote sales of sheet music. Working in Tin Pan Alley, the center of American song publishing introduced him to the era's most happening popular music. By age 25, Gershwin was rolling in the money from his Broadway show tunes. He was so well known that he'd caught the attention of Paul Whiteman, New York's most celebrated dance band leader. Whiteman commissioned Gershwin to write a jazz concerto for solo piano and orchestra. It would be played at a concert of experimental music, but Gershwin had to refuse. He was already up to his neck with his latest musical comedy. Some weeks later, George's brother Ira spotted that pesky newspaper article. George immediately buzzed Whiteman, who tried to twist his arm. But as a self-taught musician, George said he was completely inexperienced at writing large-scale orchestral works. Whiteman reassured him. You only need write the score for two piano parts, one for solo piano and the second for the orchestra. My arranger, a dude called Ferdy Grofe, will orchestrate the second for my band. Amazingly, Gershwin completed it and Grofe orchestrated it with over a week to spare. Ira titled it Rhapsody in Blue, inspired by an exhibition he'd visited. It featured the paintings of J.M. Whistler, with names like Nocturne in Black and Gold and Arrangement in Grey and Black. There was barely time for George to rehearse his piano solo with Whiteman's orchestra. He spent most of it apologizing to the musicians. If only I had more time, I could have written you a better piece. For a concert so highly anticipated, it turned out to be a total yawn fest. <sighs> In an educational lecture for the highbrow audience, Paul Whiteman explained his aim. By using the medium of jazz, Whiteman wanted the masses to be better prepared to understand and enjoy symphonies and opera. The problem was that the programme was just too long, 26 pieces, many of which sounded the same. Add to that a broken ventilation system and the audience was seriously losing their call. Cool. That's until they heard Gershwin's captivating clarinet opening. Though he wrote it as an upwards run of 17 distinct notes, Whiteman's clarinetist decided to play a joke on Gershwin during rehearsals. He smeared the notes together, what we call a glissando. The clarinet wails in a manner akin to Jewish klezmer music. Gershwin loved the effect and it's stuck ever since. The orchestra plays the first theme, the ritinello, meaning recurring as it repeats throughout the piece. It sounds jazzy because it includes lowered sevenths and minor thirds, what we call blue notes. It's followed by a blues riff, a three-note pattern that Gershwin used as the basis of his famous song, The Man I Love. The piano plays it with lots of rubato, another jazzy effect that toys with the speed and rhythm of the music. The riff binds together like glue all the major themes of the rhapsody. We hear a crescendo with the trumpets flutter-tonguing, it sounds like sarcastic raspberry blowing. <laughs> it leads into our second theme, a Latin-inspired jig. It's more the world of Tin Pan Alley dance tunes than classical music. This launches into our third theme, 
a bluesy march known as the Stride. The orchestra imitates the style of stride piano playing that Gershwin saw in the nightclubs of New York's Harlem district. Think blocky chords jumping across the keyboard. You need really big hands to play this stuff. Woodwinds and brass drive the action forward. We hear unconventional orchestral instruments like the saxophone and the banjo which keeps time. This fourth theme is called the shuffle because it mimics the sound of a high-speed train. Gershwin claimed to have devised the themes of his rhapsody on a train journey from New York to Boston. Inspired by the locomotive's rattlety bang, he claimed to have sketched the entire piece in his head by the time he'd reached Boston. Here he harnesses all the kinetic energy of modern machinery to convey the hustle and bustle of urban life. The Ritinello's theme is hijacked by woodwinds with the piano playing some slippery off-kilter notes over the top. It's a vaudeville style of piano playing called novelty piano, pioneered by a dude with the wacky name of Zez Canfri and his comic piano piece Kitten on the Keys. Solo piano now recaps the shuffle theme in a ragtime style. Think Scott Joplin's The Entertainer. Gershwin syncopates the rhythm, meaning the piano jumps onto unexpected beats out of time to give the music a ragged feel. But then a totally unexpected change of pace, a lilting love song, our fifth and final theme. This sweeping music is more rhapsody, less blues. It's the most classical bit of Gershwin's Rhapsody and became so popular that Paul Whiteman used it as his band's musical signature. It's now heard everywhere, from ringtones to commercials, and is most often associated with the United Airlines brand. Interruption! A return to Latin America with complex Cuban rhythms. The fingers hammer ferociously at a flurry of repeated notes. It's like a typewriter gone into overdrive. The orchestra plays a snappy version of the love theme in double time. It's agitated, syncopated, with accented notes in all the unnatural places, until a spine-tingling... Ouch! Rhapsody in Blue was received with tumultuous applause, the runaway hit of Paul Whiteman's concert. The piece catapulted a promising Broadway songwriter to international celebrity. It sealed Gershwin's reputation as a serious composer capable of blending different styles with amazing originality. The music reflects the European classical tradition of the Rhapsody, a long single movement piece with contrasting themes developed and varied throughout. Gershwin's five musical themes employ all the virtuosic effects and lush harmonies of Tchaikovsky, from intensely rhythmic piano solos to slow, broadly orchestrated sections. That it's a rhapsody in blue is the key, for Gershwin took the classical tradition and fused it with the vast melting pot of popular American music. Everything from the blues to ragtime, Latin dance music to Tin Pan Alley, Jewish music to Harlem jazz. Despite being Gershwin's most famous work, we'll never know what the first performance sounded like. Pressed for time, he'd not even written down much of the solo piano part. He simply improvised on the spot, nodding to Whiteman when he wanted the orchestra brought back in. It's probably why the piece worked so well because Gershwin turned his lack of formal training to his advantage. What mattered to him was the most immediate impact of his music on the listener. It's precisely why the classical music snobs hated Gershwin's piece. To them it was a formless mess, a string of themes randomly glued together against all the rules of the classical symphony. But sometimes the rules really are there to be broken and Rhapsody in Blues stood for a new sort of freedom. Perhaps it's this very freedom that explains how, from one evening in a smoky Manhattan billiards parlour, a landmark of American music was conceived, a jazz symphony befitting the American dream. Well that's it folks, follow our channel, support us on Patreon, listen to the piece in full and most importantly, enjoy classical music.
Thank you.